What's going on guys? I'm Tyler, and in continuing my series of Disney movie reviews, I'm here to let you know that The Reluctant Dragon is no perfect movie. And I'm willing to bet the majority of you haven't even heard of it, let alone seen it. So, The Reluctant Dragon is kind of, sort of, a documentary. It's basically a tour of Walt Disney Studios back when it was still brand new, from the perspective of a radio comedian who, at first, is there to pitch the old children's story, The Reluctant Dragon, as a movie to Walt Disney himself. But on his way there, he becomes distracted by every single process that comes with animation and filmmaking, and he finds himself roaming the studio, coming across so many other workers who are happy to show him the craft. And in between the tour, we see a few short films that illustrate these processes of animation, which was really eye-opening, at least for me. I knew some techniques and qualities that came with making an animated short, but... I still learned quite a few new things about it, especially through watching basically the intros to these shorts as you meet the animators and what their personalities are like and how much fun they have doing a job that they love. And that love does kind of elevate those shorts because even though they're not among the studio's best, on their own, they're completely fine. The first original short that we get to see is called Baby Weems, which is mostly presented through storyboards. We hear actors recording their lines off screen, and once in a while we see a guy on the piano playing the score of the short, but it's mostly portrayed through these still pictures that the actors bring these characters and the scenarios to life. It's basically about a baby who's discovered that he can talk at two days old, and he has like an Einstein-level IQ. He even has a moment where he corrects Einstein's behavior, and Einstein's just like, shh, don't tell anyone. And the source of comedy throughout most of this comes from the fact that his fame is actually keeping him from his parents, who are new parents, and that makes it surprisingly morbid and dark with its sense of humor, but it helps us root for them more. We want them to be reunited with their son because they've never experienced parenthood, but they want to. And it leads to a happy ending that not only was unexpected, but it actually made sense. It felt earned. It didn't feel like a total cop-out, which Disney did cop-out with happy endings before and ever since, if I'm being completely honest. But it was... It was a pretty decent short to start off with. It had that unique style that rarely ever works. The Goofy short, How to Ride a Horse, is simply just an excuse to watch Goofy doing some dumb slapstick, and that's exactly why it was my favorite out of the ones that we got. The scenarios were really creative. They took very simple situations like trying to mount a horse, trying to please a horse by offering it a carrot as a treat, Little things like that, and they expand upon it with so many good physical routines. The animation's done at a fast pace. The expressions of the horse whenever he throws Goofy off and laughs at him made it even funnier, as did the narrator. I like that this is a silent Goofy short in that Goofy doesn't actually talk. He doesn't do the scream that we all know. The narrator's just there saying, this is how you do it. Goofy does the exact opposite. The narrator never sounds phased, never even corrects him. And that's just another thing that made it the funniest and most entertaining short out of all of them. And weirdly enough, the least favorite of mine actually was The Reluctant Dragon. Which is weird, because on its own, it's... it's okay. The actor they got to play the dragon gives the character this flamboyant voice that actually makes him seem very friendly and cheerful. This knight who comes in halfway through who you expect to be the villain actually wasn't, and that was actually a change of pace. It's less cliched than Disney characters who are strongmen than you're, than you're used to nowadays. And the best part is definitely the climax where the two of them, without spoiling any, anything, engage in a fight between each other to try and please the townspeople so that something else more genuine happens so that the dragon can get himself out, out in the open more. That's all I'm really going to say about it. And it was also very funny. The knight's horse also gets a lot of good expressions just sitting there going, wait, what, this is a fake fight? Really? Why am I here? There's a lot of good components to the short. It's just, I felt like 20 minutes really dragged out the story. I don't know how long the original story was. I don't know how faithful the short was to the story, but... 
it just felt overly long. And like other older Disney movies that I've complained about before, there's a lot of dialogue that's spoken only in rhyme. And they kind of give an excuse here by having characters who are really interested in poetry, like the dragon. But it still... It still fell out of left field for me personally. Maybe... Maybe it's just my own problem, but I felt like it wasn't always essential. But easily the best part of this movie is being able to get a live tour of the studio back when it was still brand new. Because at, at that point they had only made Snow White in 37, they made Pinocchio and Fantasia in 1940. We actually get to see, and I'll talk more about this in a second, we get to see the development of Dumbo and Bambi as they were just brand new at that point. And... The more I've watched this documentary, the more I realized how important it was to advertise that they were still making so many other movies, that they had so many other ideas in development that hadn't even been announced yet. Because at that point, two of their three movies, Pinocchio and Fantasia, they bombed at the box office because of World War II. The European market was mostly populated with countries who were enemies of the U.S., so they lost a shit ton of money with that. They had so many of their animators drafted into the war like many other people, which is probably why you see so many women in this movie actually being able to do physical jobs. They're not just secretaries. They're not models. They're also animators. They're developing the paints. You see, you see women have a very pivotal role in Walt Disney at that point in time, which I didn't even think... I thought it was non-existent nowadays, given how given how poorly represented women were in some of their movies. But it was still really awesome to see the development of certain movies like Dumbo or Bambi. One of the best parts is where this comedian stumbles in on a recording session of the sound effects for Dumbo for a live drawing class where animators have to learn how to draw elephants correctly before they add human expressions like eyes or smiles. There's a live elephant that they're drawing as a reference to, and I'm hoping that was just for show, not that they actually did that, because if they actually did that, then yeah, that'd be a little weird. We get to see animated celluloid, like a picture of Bambi put up against a beautiful background. It really goes to show how animation takes a really long time to process, to sketch out first, then to draw and paint out. But when you put your work together, which they do so many times in this movie, the hard work really goes to show. It makes you realize as you're watching this movie that as much as Disney owns everything nowadays, for better or worse, they've struggled through so much over the course of several decades. And it makes me, it makes me acknowledge that Disney has earned a lot of the success that they have today. Not all of it, obviously, but a decent chunk of it. And if you like Easter eggs in Disney movies, you'll get quite a bit of that in this one scene where the comic stumbles upon a model making department where they basically mold characters out of clay to show animators what a character looks like from every certain angle. At one point I saw Captain Hook and Tinkerbell in there, and this was 1941, and I'm just like, that can't be them. Like, the movie didn't get made till, till 53, and it turns out... It actually was them, and I did some research, and it turns out there were a ton of other characters that I didn't even pay attention to. There were characters from Lady and the Tramp back there. It really goes to show. They had so many projects that they wanted to make for decades, but it wasn't until the end of the war where they finally got them off the ground. If anything, the reason Disney's earned so much success over the course of so many years is that they had to be so patient, and they rolled with it. Now, as much as it really is a blast seeing the behind the scenes of the studio, what really dragged it down was the central story of this comedian going, at first, like, avoiding any prospect of visiting the studio until his wife just keeps bugging him and eventually forces him to go. And then she ditches him to go shopping, which... I had a lot of respect for her standing up to him up until that point. And a lot of the story is moved along by him trying to avoid his tour guide, this really uptight and snooty kid who looks like he's about my age. I don't know how a guy like that had any power back then, but what do I know? And even though there's a lot more animation than there is the live action footage of the studio and of this guy, it really holds the story down because 
there is a story and there didn't really need to be. All you needed to do was show the behind the scenes of certain shorts or certain feature films and maybe have Walt Disney as a host, which I kind of thought we were, we were I kind of thought we were going to have Walt Disney as a host, but he only shows up for like a couple minutes. It was cool to see him a lot younger and just as charming and quippy as you would expect him to be, but you don't really get that much of him. And I'm fine with that part overall because the animators who we do get to meet and the behind the scenes people who contribute a lot to the success without getting any credit for it, you like those guys already. But I'd rather focus on those guys than on this one this one comedian who, if he's playing a fictional version of himself, it doesn't represent him very well. He makes a lot of dated pickup lines to the women he meets. Even though, as I said before, he's a married man. And that's like the one gender problem that's in this movie. Because as I said, the women in this are fairly respectable and get to do equal work like the men. Which, that part was great. But as I keep saying, why not just focus on them? Do we really need a main character to navigate from point A to point B? Not really. It's already exciting to see a new studio that we would later on realize became this huge conglomerate if this was just a documentary about seeing shorts start off from scratch to a finished product or see little glimpses of fe future feature length movies to get audiences excited and us excited because we know that they would end up becoming classics over time then this would be a really good behind the scenes featurette but as is it's a mixture of very mind-blowing and very insightful facts about the disney about Disney as a business, as what would eventually become a huge driving force in the movie making industry, mixed with a very awkward, boring, and generic story that just didn't need to exist. So for all those reasons, I'm going to give The Reluctant Dragon a 3 out of 5. If you're a big animation fan, I would highly recommend checking this movie out. It's just... It's nothing completely significant other than getting to see a tour of the studio and getting glimpses of things that you didn't know about. So, guys, thanks as always for watching. If by any chance you have seen The Reluctant Dragon, let me know in the comments below what you thought of it. Be sure to stay tuned for more Disney reviews, and be sure to like and subscribe. Take care!